Hello, I'm Fred Keating, and welcome to Fred Keating and Friends, conversations with people who make a difference. I'm not sure I chose to do it. I was kind of propelled into it. It was I, I don't remember choosing to do this crazy life. What I miss is being in the forest. I miss nature. I mean that's that's really who I am. But at the same time it's enabled me to meet so many extraordinary people. My mission is to bring you insightful guests sharing ideas on how you can make a difference in your life and the lives of others by making the best use of your time and talent. And it was called Tarzan of the Apes. And I read it, and of course I fell passionately in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And what did he go and do? He just married the wrong Jane. Jane, do you really want me to spell that? J-A-N-E, and I can even do it backwards, E-N-A-J. And then good all is all good, good all. I'm not going to spell that one. Well, I don't know what I am really, an environmentalist, an activist, a conservationist, an ethologist, and what am I doing? Trying to save the world, that's all. How's that going? Not very well right now. Dr. Jane Goodall. That name ring a bell? Jane Goodall is probably one of the few people on the planet who does not need an introduction. But for those of you from other planets who may be listening in, Dr. Jane Goodall is an amazing earthling. Known for her groundbreaking research and publications based on her years in the jungles of Tanzania, Africa, studying and living alongside and among chimpanzees. She is also known over the past four decades for tirelessly serving her namesake organization, the Jane Goodall Institute. A global community conservation organization JGI, as it's referred to, was founded in California in 1977. The Institute continues Dr. Goodall's pioneering work with chimpanzees and manages additional educational and environmental programs in nearly 100 countries. On the road and in the air some 300 days a year, Dr. Goodall has been traveling the world, teaching us what we can do to help contribute to the health of this planet and all of the life forms on it. I've had the good fortune of meeting with her several times and introducing her at a number of presentations over the past few years and finally have today managed to track this elusive prey right into its now natural habitat, that being a hotel room that could be anywhere around the world. And so here we sit with the great storyteller, Jane Goodall, and I understand birthday congratulations are perhaps a few days late, but in order. So happy birthday, Jane. In fact, you're on your annual birthday tour now, and, and I see that you have your trusted traveling companions with you today. I have indeed. And, you know, this is a tour that actually goes on year after year after year since 1986 all around the world with very few pauses. And it just happens to be that my birthday was, well, whenever April the 3rd was, and I travel with the, the most famous of my traveling companions is Mr. H. And Mr. H was given to me 26 years ago. His birthday is the same day as mine because he was a birthday present. And he's called Mr. H because the man who gave him to me is Gary Horn. And Mr. H is a symbol for the indomitable human spirit. So when Gary was 21, he was with the U.S. Marines. His helicopter had a crash and he was totally blinded. So for some bizarre reason, he decided he wanted to become a magician. And everybody said, but Gary, you can't be a magician if you're blind. And he said, well, I can try. And the children don't know he's blind. He's completely amazing. And he'll then tell them and say if things go wrong in your life don't give up there's always a way forward he does scuba diving and cross-country skiing and skydiving and he's just taught himself to paint and so he's produced a book called blind artist which is available on amazon he's amazing so he gave me mr h thinking mr h was a stuffed chimpanzee but actually he has a tail which I made Gary hold, and he said, never mind, take him where you go, and you know I'm with you in spirit. So he's been with me now 
uh, to 63 countries, and we're still going strong together. I've seen him on stage with you. I've seen him on television with you. Bill Maher uh, show as well as uh, and John Oliver, was he? Oh, yes. Ah, yes. They are everywhere with you. And tell us about uh, the other members of the menagerie here in front of us. Well, Cow is a more recent acquisition, and I've had her about three to four years. And I use her when I'm talking particularly to young people about the danger of more and more meat being eaten around the planet, which leads, one, to unbelievable cruelty in the factory farms and the abattoirs. But secondly, it's destroying acres and acres of forest because the animals have to be fed, so they're given grain, and a lot of fossil fuel is used to take the grain to the animals and then the animals to the slaughterhouse and the meat to the table. And in addition, a lot of water is wasted transforming vegetable protein into animal protein. And on top of that, uh, when I use cow to demonstrate that the food goes in one end and gas comes out the other, and that's methane. And that's an even more virulent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And of course, the greenhouse gases are these gases that form a sort of blanket around the earth and trap the sun's heat. And this is leading to the gradual warming of the globe, which leads to this tremendous disruption in climates around the world, climate change. A new member of the menagerie of these small stuffed animals that accompany you everywhere and in the presentations looks like a rat. It is a rat. And it was actually given to me by a group called Doctors Against Animal Experimentation in, in Germany. But I actually use Ratty, Ratty's his name, like Ratty in the Wind in the Willows. And Ratty serves as a giant forest rat or a giant pouched rat. They come from Africa. They're very common. And they have an amazing sense of smell, as do normal rats. So the amazing man who uh, thought of this is a Belgian, and he got passionate to find a way of detecting the landmines that are scattered around all over Cambodia and Mozambique, places where there have been these, these um, civil wars. And so many people he met had lost a leg or been injured in some way by stepping on one of these unexploded landmines. So dogs are used, they can sniff them out, and occasionally they actually explode a bomb. But these rats are so light. And the giant forest rat, unlike the common rat, lives for about eight or nine years. And I've watched them being trained in Tanzania. They're absolutely amazing and very adorable, actually. And they can detect these unexploded landmines and they can also detect the earliest signs if a patient has TB, which of course became endemic because of the AIDS epidemic. And now they've been taught some of them can detect ivory, some can detect rhino horn, some can detect uh, pangolin, pangolin scales or pangolin body parts. And so these rats being small and agile are taken to the, the containers in the airports and the docks, and they can climb up among those containers and sniff out this illegal contraband. It's amazing. Talk about being handed lemons and making lemonade. What, a, what an amazing use of what most people still consider a pest, if not a disease carrier. Yes, and the thing is that for so long we've misjudged animals. So that, you know, when I began my study of chimpanzees, I'd never been to college, thank goodness. So I, I didn't realize that animals didn't have personalities or minds or emotions. Nobody told me that. And yet when I got to Cambridge University to do a PhD, because my mentor, Louis Leakey, said, I have to get a degree to carry on and get my own money when he was gone, they... They shocked me, these professors, by telling me animals didn't have personalities, minds or feelings, and that I shouldn't be talking about the chimpanzees like that, and that I should have given them numbers. It was wrong to give them names. That wasn't scientific. 
But fortunately, although I was actually scared of these professors, I mean, you know, they had so much education compared to me who'd never been to college. And yet I knew they were wrong in this because I'd had this wonderful teacher during my childhood. It was my dog, Rusty. So if you share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a rabbit, a rat, a cow, a pig, uh, a bird, you know the professors were wrong. And I think they knew too. But if you're a scientist, you must be able to prove everything. And they couldn't prove it, therefore it wasn't true. You have been traveling or traipsing after various non-human companions almost since you could walk. What do you recall as your first fascination with our fellow travelers on the planet? Well, my mother tells me that it began when I was one and I took a whole handful of earthworms to bed. And she said, Jane, I came in and it really looked as though you were wondering how on earth do they walk without legs? Anyway, she, instead of getting angry with me, she said, you know, they need the garden or they'll die. And we took them back. But then when I was four and a half, we went for a holiday into the country, uh, onto a farm, a proper farm, where cows and pigs and horses were out in the fields the way they should be. And I was given a job of collecting the hen's eggs. And so I apparently began asking everybody, but where, where does the egg come out of the hen? I couldn't see a hole as big as an egg. And nobody told me. So what I distinctly remember is seeing this hen go into one of these little wooden hen houses where they slept at night and the nest boxes for egg laying were around the edge and thinking, I must have thought she's going to lay an egg. And I remember crawling after her, which was a big mistake, and she flew out with squawks of fear. I suppose it was fear. And so, <clears throat> again, in this little four-and-a-half-year-old mind, I must have thought, well, no hen will come in here. This is a frightening place. So by now, you know, the, the, the urge to discover is strong. So I go into an empty hen house and wait and wait and wait and wait. And apparently I was gone four hours. So the family were desperate. They didn't know where I was. And of course, when my mother saw me, she could so easily have said, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you dare do it again, which would have killed all the excitement. So how lucky I was to have such a supportive, understanding mother, because if, if I'd been reprimanded, maybe all that scientific curiosity would have been crushed. And if you look and think about that story, there is the making of a little scientist, the curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, and learning patience. It was all there. And thanks to my mother, I was able to continue to develop that curiosity through my childhood. When did the curiosity or fascination with Africa come about? It came about from books, because when I was growing up, there was no TV. So it was books and radio. That was it. And I met Dr. Doolittle when I was eight. And if people haven't read Dr. Doolittle, they really should. And in one of the Dr. Doolittle books, this wonderful man who has learned animal language which is why I fell in love with all of, you know, what I wanted to learn animal language. Anyway, in one of the books, he takes circus animals back to Africa, back home. And that, that was the first sort of love of Africa. But then two years later, I had just enough money for this little tiny book in a second-hand bookshop. And it was called Tarzan of the Apes. And I read it and of course I fell passionately in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And what did he go and do? He just married the wrong Jane. So, <laughs> so that was when I, my dream began. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. I, I wanted to be a naturalist. I never thought of being a scientist. You know, back then, 70 years ago, girls in England didn't become scientists. They became nurses or teachers or, or just wives. So everybody laughed at me. How will you get to Africa? It's far away. You don't have any money. There's a war raging. And anyway, you're just a girl. 
But my mother never laughed at me, and she simply said, if you really want something, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of opportunity, and never give up. So that's the story I share with young people around the world, particularly in disadvantaged communities, particularly with girls. And the reward is the number of these people who've come up to me and said, Jane, I want to thank you because you taught me that because you did it, I can do it too. So you've become, whether face-to-face or at a distance, a mentor for several generations of young people at this point. In addition to your wonderful mother, who were some of the other meaningful mentors in your life? Well, I've I've already mentioned my dog, Rusty. I mean, he was a great mentor, and he was a very extraordinary dog, but he taught me so much. And then I suppose the next mentor who came along was Dr. Louis Leakey, because after I'd saved up and got to Africa to stay with a school friend, I heard about Louis Leakey. Somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Louis Leakey. And I met him, and that led to him giving me a job. I think because he was amazed that this young girl straight out from England knew so much about animals because I'd followed my mother's advice. I'd read everything I could find about African animals. I'd spent hours in the Natural History Museum when I had a job in London. And so I could answer most of his questions. And that led to this extraordinary suggestion that I should go and learn about chimpanzee behavior in the wild. Nobody would ever done it. And that brings us to what many consider one of the pivotal moments in your career, Uh, having spent some time becoming acquainted in a variety of of ways with the chimpanzees. And and can you tell us about the eye-opening day that you had and a bit about how you integrated yourself into that particular community and culture? The biggest problem when I first arrived was that they ran away at the sight of me. I mean, they'd never seen a white ape before, which is what I was, what I am, what you are too. You're a white ape as well. And so they would take one look and and vanish. And there was only money for six months. I mean, who was going to give money for this crazy idea of leakies? A young girl out in the forest? Well, anyway, finally we got money for six months, or he got money for six months from um, an American businessman, actually. And so I was getting more and more worried as the days became weeks and the weeks became months, because if I didn't find something exciting, then that would be the end, and I would have let Leakey down, and he would have let this wealthy businessman down, and it was all awful. But then on this one day... Everything changed. One chimpanzee, whom I'd named David Greybeard, was the first to begin to lose his fear. I still couldn't get very close. But I saw him crouched on a termite mound, and with my binoculars, I could see him break off grass stems, and I could see him pushing them down into the termite mound, pulling them out, and presumably picking the termites off with his lips and chewing them up. I couldn't see that well. That's what he was doing. And then I saw him break off leafy twigs and to use them as tools, he had to strip off the leaves. So that's the beginning of tool making. At that time, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. We were defined as man, the tool maker. And that was the observation that enabled Leakey to get the National Geographic Society to come in to promise money, to continue the research. They sent a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwek, a Dutchman. And although I initially resented his intrusion into my beautiful alone world in the forest, nevertheless, eventually I married him, so it worked. (laughs) Did that give you any additional status with the chimpanzees, that the the white ape could, in fact, attract another white ape, and now there were two of you? No, at first they, it, was, it was worse because they got used to me, but they know individuals. So they would run away from Hugo, and I had to build little hides, and he had to hide in them and to get the early film. But then David began to lead others into my camp where he discovered he could find bananas, 
and the banana feeding era began. And for Hugo, that was perfect because the chimps came to him. And that's how he got all this so famous early footage. And it was Hugo's film and stills that took Jane and the chimps into the living rooms around America and then around the world through the National Geographic Society. And, as I recall, a quite an incredible spread in Life magazine at the time. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> I hadn't. I had, we had Life magazine in, in our family, and, and those were the first photos that I had seen about this young girl in the jungle. Well, it's, it, um, as soon as the geographic articles were published, everybody wanted to interview me, and I didn't like it. I hated it. I was shy. Has it gotten any better over the years? Well, more and more people, you know, want a bit of Jane. And people want to put me in their films and people want quotes from me and people want me all the time to do so much. And, you know, the reason I left Gombe to go out into this crazy lecture circuit was when I realized that chimp numbers in Africa were dropping, that forests were disappearing, that they were being killed for the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, mothers shot to sell babies into captivity uh, for entertainment, zoo, circuses, and in those days, medical research. And I knew I had to try and do something. By, by that time, you know, I'd learned an awful lot about the chimps, established a research station, and I knew I had to leave and try and raise awareness around the world. And that brings us to another great chapter in your career and another pivotal moment. It was a, a conference in Chicago, 1986? Yeah, 1986 saw the publication of the, the result of analyzing all the years of research that I had completed by that time, beginning in 1960. And the uh, director of the Chicago Academy of Sciences thought it would be great to celebrate this, this first really big book dealing with a single animal and the longest study that had been done at that time. And so he organized this conference and brought chimpanzee researchers from by then there were about six or seven field sites in Africa to discuss how the chimps' behavior differed from one site to another, what sort of cultural differences there might be. We already knew the reports of objects used in different ways from these different sites. So how great to bring everybody together and have four days of discussions and, and learning and sharing information. But at the same time, we had a, a session on conservation, which was so shocking, just realizing what was going on. And we had another session on conditions in some captive situations, like the tremendously cruel training of entertainment chimps, circus chimps. And what gave me nightmares for weeks was secretly filmed footage of chimpanzees in medical research laboratories in tiny five foot by five foot cages. And, you know, by then I knew so much about their rich social life, how they spend hours grooming each other, the close bonds between family members. It's a very, very rich society. And they're so like us in so many ways. They kiss, embrace, hold hands, pat one another. They beg for food with their hand outstretched. They swagger and shake their fists and remind one sometimes of some politicians who are vying with each other to get to the top. And they use rocks as weapons. They have very good aim, some of them. And then you get these close bonds between mothers and their offspring, bonds that can last through 60 years of life, the close bonds that develop between the brothers and sisters. And to see one of these beings in this five foot by five foot cage, knowing nothing but people in white coats coming to draw blood or anesthetize them for some reason. It was utterly shocking. I, I was devastated. And so it was this conference that changed me. So I went to it as a scientist, having a wonderful life, 
time in the forest, um, bright students from Stanford and Cambridge to just have discussions with in the evenings. I had a son by then, little boy Grub. He was, yes, named, nicknamed Grub when it stuck. And, but I left that conference as an activist. That was October 1986. And I haven't been consecutively more than three weeks anywhere since. I remember when we first met over lunch, it was in October, several years ago. And I can remember asking you, where do you go from here? And you started to recite a number of cities and countries ricocheting back and forth, some 12 to 15 separate places where you were going to present for one or more times over a couple of days. And then when I thought that you were reciting your entire next year's schedule, you said, and then I'll probably nip home for Christmas for a couple of days. And I was gobsmacked. Is that the right (laughs) word? I was gobsmacked. I thought, she's telling me what she's doing over the next eight weeks or so. And it sounds like uh, anybody else's annual tour. I also remember asking you, it was noon and you had spent not the entire evening, but you'd arrived the night before at the airport around midnight and spent an hour or so walking around while they tried to locate your luggage. And then some 10-ish hours later, we were having a coffee and a bit to eat. And I said, how, how do you keep track of what? I know where you are, but where's your body right now? What time zone are you in? And you remember what you said? I probably said that... Um Jet lag didn't exist. I don't know what I said, but... You said you were on Jane time. Okay, that's very clever. I remember that answer. (laughs) And Jane time was... Well, tell us what Jane time is. Well, Jane time is because it's so crazy what I'm doing. Uh, You know, like in in North America, I've been... For some bizarre reason, everything went wrong. And instead of planning East Coast and West Coast, it was crisscross, crisscross, crisscross. Crazy. And so you're always in different time zones. So the best thing to do is to ignore it. Uh, when you when when it's light, it's morning, and when it's dark, it's night. Don't ever go to the Yukon in the summertime. <laughs> no. I, I've been in Greenland, and it was a nightmare. I mean, there was no dark. It was really, really hard. What advice, and I know you get asked this question every place you go, every audience you speak with, Uh, one or more individuals, probably speaking for many, say, what advice would you offer young people who might wish to pursue a career in the same general area of of conservation or nature or science of uh, that you have? Well, first of all, I'd say that it's becoming quite competitive and difficult to get involved sometimes. So you have to be really passionate. You've got to really want this. And you've got to be prepared to work really hard. And you've got to be prepared to perhaps not get straight away to do what you want to do. You may have to wait and do it in a circuitous way. After all, I began doing a secretarial course because we couldn't afford university. And I got various boring jobs. It then turned out the secretarial uh, course was really useful because it gave me a job with Lewis Leakey as his secretary. And that led to the chimps. So you may not always be able to get directly to your goal, but the main thing is don't forget it. And sometimes you can, you know, your passion might be music. I want to be a musician. But you're perhaps not quite good enough to get into music school. But you can still... uh, You know, music can still be a very, very important part of your life. And one day you might make it. I love that philosophy that nothing is wasted. That even though I may want to be a writer but need to work in in retail or in the restaurant until I can get enough time to write, I love to think that even those unhappy times that there is a life lesson there or that there is grist for the mill that someday will come back and solve a problem or a question or a challenge that's been placed in one's way. Yes, I think that's true. And, you know, life is filled with challenges. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you remain hopeful? Because the world today is, is a bit sad. And 
I see forests disappearing and I see animals becoming extinct, you know, in the middle of the sixth great extinction. But at the same time, I've also met amazing people. I've seen how destroyed areas can be restored. And I think it's because you, you're aware of the, the magnitude of the problem. And then when you see people solving it, you think, well, that's a good lesson for me to learn. Even if it's really terrible, there are solutions. So seeing the bad part is really encouraging you to find ways to solve it. I mean, I, for example, I was taken to visit a project in Taiwan and there was an industrial city and the water that came out of it into the river was, it was just so unbelievably polluted, it stank. And they designed a way of cleaning the water just by redirecting it through a new channel with different kinds of plants that can actually extract, firstly, the heavy metals and then different kind of pollutants from the water. And at the end, there was a big wetland they created filled with birds and flowers and trees. And the water that went back into the original river, uh, you know, course was pure and beautiful. I'd be hard pressed to think of another individual who has seen as much of the world and various aspects of the natural and, for want of a better term, a developed or civilized world. Uh, Uncivilized. We're not, we're not very civilized today. We've become enmeshed in materialistic, money-grabbing monies that, you know, to be successful, you must have lots of money and lots of goods and lots of maybe two houses and two cars and be great if you had a, a private yacht. Then you're successful. doesn't mean you're happy. And it does mean that you're harming the planet in a horrible way. But we've got off on the wrong track. We, we have to change our attitude if we care about the future for our children. Think about how we're misusing nature's resources. Too fast. And they're finite. They're not infinite. What can you tell me? What can you share with me about the trade-offs that you've had to make in your life, personally and professionally, in order to continue in the work that you have chosen to do? What's it cost you? I'm not sure I chose to do it. I was kind of propelled into it. it was, I, I don't remember choosing to do this crazy life. But, but basically, it's what I miss is being in the forest. I miss nature. I mean, that's, that's really who I am. But at the same time, it's enabled me to meet so many extraordinary people, uh, to learn so much about, on the one hand, the harm that we're doing, but on the other hand, what we can do to put things not back as they were before. That'll never quite happen, but at least to make huge improvements, like cleaning the river, like, um, well, I always remember flying over Gombe, in 1990 in a small plane and looking down with horror to see a small island of forest, which is Gombe National Park, that once was a part of this great equatorial forest belt, we called it, that went all the way from East Africa to the West Coast. And around this little oasis of forest <clears throat> were completely bare hills, more people than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And I realized at that moment, unless we can improve the lives of these people, we can't even try to save the chimpanzees. So that led to JGI, uh, our program to improve the lives of the people in a very holistic way. It's worked. We're now in six different countries. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Roots and Shoots. Uh, it celebrated its 25th anniversary last year. I got to speak with Jen Duffy, who is one of your activists in, in that particular area. Tell me about Roots and Shoots and, and how that has spread. Well, when I was initially traveling around, it was to raise awareness about the problems faced by the chimps. 
and then the problems faced by the people and to raise money because it costs money, these programs in Africa. And as I was traveling around, I was meeting more and more young people who seemed to have lost hope. They, they were depressed or angry or mostly just apathetic. And when I talked to them, they basically said, well, we feel this way because you older generations have compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. And we have compromised their future. And, you know, it, it's a shock to think of what if we carry on the way we are now, this rate of exploitation of the natural resources, this rate of development and destruction of forests and wetlands and so forth. What's, what's it going to be like for our children in a hundred years? What's going to be left? And when the young people said, there's nothing we can do about it, I thought, well, that's where you're wrong. I think there's a window of time. And if enough people get together, then we can begin to make meaningful change. So the Roots and Shoots program began with 12 high school students in Tanzania in 91. And then it began to spread. And right from the beginning, the main message, every single one of us makes a difference every single day. Every one of us matters. Every one of us has a role to play. It's like all the complex life in a rainforest where everything is interconnected and even the tiniest little species has a role. And it's like that with us in our lives on the planet. So we decided right from the beginning that each group, and we were determined to have groups starting all over the place, uh, each group would choose three projects, uh, one to help people, one to help other animals, and one to help the environment. And it began, it's sort of like a grassroots movement. It began to grow. A kid would leave a school, move to another one, start another Roots and Shoots group. And so today we're in 98 countries. There's about, a, I didn't, we don't really know, but 150,000 groups, not, not individuals, groups. And they actually are changing the world. They range in age from kindergarten through university. Uh, we've even started working with older people too, but it's mainly youth-driven. And I think the reason it grows so fast is because the kids get to choose what to do. So they do what they're passionate about. And, you know, so as I'm going around the world everywhere, there are these young people with shining eyes wanting to tell Dr. Jane what they're doing to make the world better. It's my greatest reason for hope. You've had so many terrific adventures in your career. What is the next great adventure that you look forward to? I'm not sure if I look forward to it, but, <clears throat> you know, I'm 83, and I don't know how many years I have left on this planet. People are living longer and longer, so, you know, it could be another 10, 20, I don't know. But the end of my life on this earth will come to a close. And to me, this is going to be either it's the end, finish, in which case, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? It's just finished. Or there's something beyond this life, something for the spirit. And if that's true, which I actually believe it is, what an amazing adventure to find out what is beyond death for us. What will happen? What's it like? But, you know, out in the forest, I've sensed this great spiritual power with a little bit of that spirit in each of us that we call a soul. And I'm totally fascinated by this. So I'm not saying I look forward to dying. I think it's the act of dying that's frightening because, you know, those ways we'd all choose to die if we could, but maybe that won't be our lot. But, but death itself isn't frightening. It's an adventure. You once said, what you do makes a difference, and you need to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. Jane, are you aware of the difference that you've made in people's lives and in some of the areas of the world that you've traveled? Are you aware of, of that when you travel and, and meet some of these young people with shining eyes? It took me a long time to realize, but 
Yes, I, I can't help but realize it now because everywhere I go, people tell me, you've changed my life. Um, because of you, I'm a veterinarian. Um, it happens everywhere. And, and I was particularly impressed this last visit to China. I've been going there since 93. And the number of people who said, well, of course I care about the environment. I was in Roots and Chutes in primary school. Or, of course I, I understand about animals. I watched your geographic documentaries when I was a kid. And I've seen the change in attitude in China towards environment and animals. And it was only just really this last trip that I realized what a huge impact this program's had in causing that change of attitude. That's incredible. I think of so many teachers who remain unaware of the seeds they may have planted in the, the thousands of students that they've run into, aside from the odd meeting in the uh, supermarket. Mr. Jeffrey, is that you? <laughs> you know, you probably don't remember me, but I'm... And yet the fact that you are aware of and reminded of on a constant basis of the change that you've initiated and pushed through, but also pushed on to other people to take up the baton and continue the race. That's marvelous. Well, yes, I, I couldn't do it. <clears throat> couldn't do it on my own, could I? So that's why Roots and Shoots is creating, you know, young people who have the passion and realize that it can be done. And if I didn't realize that I was making an impact, I couldn't carry on like this because my life is crazy. I don't enjoy traveling. But because you know you're making a difference and because it's so important now with the world in the mess it's in to give people hope that if we just hang in there and get together and make use of social media in the right way and bring people together around a cause and share stories about hope that, yes, we can restore this landscape. Yes, we can save this animal from extinction. Uh, this is, that's what enables me to keep going. That, I think, appears to be a big difference between those who talk a lot about hope or how great things can be or become again, as opposed to, in fact, having loads of, well, decades of examples to back up, to show as evidence for hope and for change and for progress. Jane Goodall, thank you so, so much for the time that you've shared with all of our listeners and for being kind enough to uh, indulge this white ape in his asking you questions I'm sure you've answered many, many times. Well, it's been great talking with you. Thanks. And um, I hope that many people listen to this and join our Roots and Shoots family because we're changing the world and I'd like everyone to be part of that change. We'll see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thanks. After many of our meetings, I receive a lovely handwritten thank you note from Dr. Goodall, so I thought this time I'd be the first to write after this latest encounter. So here goes. Dear Jane, as always, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and catch up and in a program such as this to share your messages in a way that would allow people around the world to hear directly from you as the primary source about your principles and practices how you have parlayed your passion for all forms of life into a lifetime of service, inspiring others to get involved in so many local, national, and international good works, generating hope in people wherever they happen to be, whatever the challenges. So thank you, E-N-A-J Goodall, or All Good as you called it, and all best wishes on all your ongoing and upcoming adventures. Sincerely, your friend. Fred. And to you listeners, thank you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada for arranging this interview and Wolf Willow Studios, sound design and production of Edmonton for the technical production required, Jack Keating for the on-site audio recording, as well as Lindisfarne Productions, Inc. for their ongoing support. This interview was conducted on Friday, April 14th, 2017 at the Pacific Concord Hotel in Richmond, British Columbia. Fred Keating and friends saying, travel safely.